Hello. Okay. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 2015 Bay Area Youth Summit. Uh, ooh, yeah. uh, my name is Darcy Pancoast, and I'm actually the executive director of FaZe, so very proud to be presenting the summit. This is the third summit that I have worked on with FaZe. Uh, so before we really get into things, just a little bit more about FaZe. Uh, FaZe started as the brainchild of a friend of mine named Jason Galisatis. So back in 2011, he put on the very first summit at Aragon High School. Uh, and back then, while we weren't a nonprofit, he had to work pretty hard in order to jump through some, some hoops and red tape. And once he became college bound, he decided, hey, this was a really cool thing and a really awesome idea, and I should make a nonprofit. And so at, what were we, 18, uh, he started a, started a nonprofit, and we became incorporated in September of 2012, and then held our first summit as an official nonprofit in 2013, that was back at Aragon High School again. And then last year, we were at Harvey Milk Civil Rights Academy, and now here we are at Buena Vista Horace Mann, uh, about to have a wonderful day for you all. And so uh, our first speaker is a wonderful woman who I had the pleasure of meeting last night named Robin Oakes. And she is an educator and a speaker and an award-winning activist. Uh, she's the editor of Buy Women Quarterly, which, uh, and a 42-country anthology called Getting By, Voices of Bisexuals Around the World, which is about to be published in Spanish as well, uh, I believe. Uh, and also, the new anthology recognized the voices of bisexual men. And so if you're in the area, there's also going to be an event for that in Monday in Berkeley, throwing in a little, a little plug. Uh, she's been published in numerous uh, bisexual, women's studies, multicultural, and LGBT anthologies. Uh, she serves on the board of directors of Mass Equality, which is Massachusetts' statewide equality organization, and the Massachusetts Commission on LGBTQ Youth. She's also the co-founder and current treasurer of Boston Bisexual Women's Network. And she also serves on the faculty of Camp Pride Summer Leadership Camp, which is a week-long leadership institute for LGBTQ and allied college students, and also of the Expanding Cir the Circle Conference, which is a program sponsored by the California Institute for Integral Studies, designed for academic deans, administrators, and faculty members, and counselors, and even students, uh, and nonprofit professionals like myself, uh, who seek to advance LGBTQ issues and concerns uh, in the university and academy. She's also taught courses at MIT, uh, Tufts University, and Johnson State College on a variety of topics, including LGBT history and politics, the politics of sexual orientation, uh, and the experiences of those who transgress the gay, straight, mask, femme, black, white, male, female binaries that society tries to force us into. Uh, she's an advocate for the rights of people of all genders and all orientations and is working to increase awareness of complex identities and mobilizing people to ally across identities. Uh, she's spoken at over 500 colleges, universities, conferences, and public events. And her many awards include, most recently, PFLAG's Brenda Howard Award, the National LGBT Task Force Susan J. Hyde Activism Award, and the Harvard Gender and Sexuality Caucus's Lifetime Achievement Award. So with that, I am very proud to present to you all Robin Oaks. Hi. Hi. That made me tired. So hi, everybody. Can you all hear me? Are you all awake? Kind of. Okay, kind of is good enough. So, my name is Robin Oaks, and I am a professional bisexual. <laughs> Seriously, I am. Um, I'm a writer, I'm a community activist, and I'm a speaker who gets to travel around the country, and sometimes other countries, speaking about gender and sexuality, you know, focusing, as Darcy said, on issues that are, co on identities that are complicated, on identities that challenge binaries that mess up simple narratives and that make people uncomfortable, I think in very good ways. And I love my work. I love my work. And I love it for many, many reasons. Um, 
partly because I feel like I'm making a difference. And it feels good. And also because my work puts me in contact with people like you. You know, people who are involved in social justice, people who are engaged, people who actually care and who are trying to make the world a better place. And that, for me, that's the absolute best part of my work, is, is you. And so I want to be part of a community that's committed to, by the way, I need to show you what's going on here, why I'm looking down. Is that not the strangest podium you've ever seen? <laughs> I thought I'd be up here, so I can that's all. <laughs> okay. So I want to be part of a community that is committed to embracing difference. You know, and I want to be part of a, of a community where difference is valued, um, a community that values all of our bodies, all of our identities, all of our genders, all of us. And our differences, our messiness, our complexities are precisely what I love about us. You know, so let's build community based not upon the idea that we all have to be the same and conform you know, to some, some little narrative, but rather a community that's based on the understanding that when we all come together across all of our differences and support each other, that that's when we're powerful. So our identities are complicated. Raise your hand if you have a complicated identity. Look around the room. Almost everybody has their hand up. I love that. So one of the ways in which our identities are powerful is that we are intersectional. We are not just one thing. And intersectionality is a term that was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, a black feminist. And I want to shout out here to black feminists because it's amazing how much of social justice thinking comes from the work of black feminists. So yay. <laughs> I looked at one of the talks I gave recently and I realized that out of the five quotes, four of them were from black feminists. So, yeah, I, I have a tremendous amount of, of respect and also gratitude for their work. Anyway, so intersectionality basically, among other things, is the idea that every single person has many different categories of identity. We have sexual orientations. We have gender identities, but we also have a lot of other identities. Can anybody just think of some of the other identities that we have? Race. Racial identities, yes? Immigration, Immigration status. Ability. Ability. Religious. Religious. Gender, expression. gender expression, not the same as gender identity, yep. Class. Class. Age. Age. Political identity. What you're studying is part of your identity, where you live, where you grew up, and so on and so forth. So every single person has many different categories of identity. So intersectionality is the idea that each of our identities affects the way in which we experience each of our other identities. So for example, the way you experience your sexual orientation is determined by where you live, it's determined by how old you are, it's determined by your religious background, it's determined by the kind of family that you come from, it's determined even by who your friendship network is, and so on and so forth. And I do this thing sometimes that I, to try to hold myself in perspective, I call it the, my intersectionality game, where I try to remember how specific my own identity is. And what I do is I think, how would my experience of being me be different if one of my identities was dramatically different. And so I'll play this game where I swap out something for something else. So I think, for example, I, let me just give you some of my identities. I identify as a woman. I identify as female, as semi-femme, as bisexual, as pansexual, as queer, as a person who's at least temporarily able-bodied. I identify as someone of mixed blend European descent. I identify as a first-generation American. I identify as someone who comes from a complicated class background. I identify as secular and Jewish. I identify as a Northeasterner. Very specifically, I identify as a New Yorker who lives in Boston. 
So sometimes identities are not one word, but sometimes they're actually a little, little story in and of themselves. And I also identify, starting this year, I started identifying as middle-aged. <laughs> and this was actually a funny story, because last, last fall, I was thinking about my identities, and I kind of did the math. And I thought, oh, I'm middle-aged. And I thought, I'll, I'm going to claim that. I'm going to embrace that. I'm going to take that one on. So that's one of my identities. So thinking about intersectionality, I think, for example, how would my experience, do you think I'd have a different experience of being bisexual if I identified as a man instead of as a woman? Me too. Do you think I'd have a different experience of being bisexual if, instead of being middle-aged, what if I were a teenager right now? Do you think I'd have a different experience? How different? Hella different, right? <laughs> You know, or do you think I'd have a different experience of being bisexual if instead of growing up in New York City, what if I had grown up on a farm in rural Idaho? <laughs> <laughs> what if instead of being quite left of center, what if I had grown up in a family that was extremely politically conservative? Do you think I'd have a different experience? And what if instead of growing up in a secular family, what if my parents had been Mormons? Mm, I saw someone go, ooh. <laughs> so for me, this is like, and what if instead of growing up in the United States, what if I grew up in Uganda? Do you think I'd have a different experience of coming out? Do you think I'd express my, my identity differently? And so for me, this is really where intersectionality plays out. It's really understanding that each of us has identities that are very, very specific to us. And before I understood the, type of, the idea of intersectionality, I would meet someone else who identified as bisexual just like me, and I'd think, oh, yay, I identify as bisexual, you identify as bisexual, we're both bisexual. And I would somehow assume that that meant that we were the same. <laughs> Do you think I was off base? And now, I was so off base, and now, Thinking intersectionally, when I meet someone else who identifies as bisexual, I think, oh wow, isn't that exciting? We share an intersection. We share this thing in common, and we probably share other ones as well, but I don't know what they are yet. And so that's a really different way of approaching identity. And it means that there are as many different experiences of being bisexual as there are people who identify with that word. So this, this is what I have learned. Okay. Middle-aged. <laughs> for the record, I used to make so much fun of my mother for her reading, like when she couldn't see the menu. I'd say, hey, mom, you want me to hold the menu for you? <laughs> and she'd say, very funny. Revenge. <laughs> so anyway, um, another example of, of what happens when we fail to think intersectionally is the following. So, Think, for example, of the stereotype of the gay man. Ready? The gay man. I'm going to ask you some questions. Quick, what race is he? How old is he? 20s and 30s, yeah. Where does he live? Some big coastal city, yes. Um, what's his social class status? And what kind of body does he have? Is he disabled? So for me, this is exactly what happens when people fail to think intersectionally. Have you ever heard someone talk about one of your identities and thought, they're not talking about me, even though you use that identity? And I feel like that's what happens when we don't think intersectionally, we start seeing people as these flat cutouts, these like cardboard cutouts and not as real people. And I think that we need to reclaim the complexity of what these identities are. Because are some gay men old? Do some gay men live on farms? Are some gay men disabled? Are some gay men brown and black and yellow and all kinds of colors? So this, and for me, this is really, really important. So that all of my work now is kind of trying to, I try to rest all of my work on this base and on this assumption. And you know, to also take this even farther, when I think about intersectionality, it also means to me that we need to always think about multiple issues simultaneously. We can't reduce anything into a single issue movement. And as far as I'm concerned, a, lesbian, a black lesbian should never ever be told that racism is not an LGBTQ issue. 
you know, and someone with a disability should never be told that disability rights are not LGBTQ issues. And so on and so forth. So for me, this is also where intersectionality goes, goes when you start thinking about it. Okay. And furthermore, thinking about identity, none of us should ever be told that there's a correct way to be any identity. Raise your hand if you've ever been told you were not doing your identity properly. Crap, everyone has their hand up. <laughs> Raise your hand if you've ever felt like you were too queer. Bunch of people. Raise your hand if you've ever felt like you were not queer enough. Even more people. And raise your hand if you've ever felt like you were not the right kind of queer. This is the stuff we need to challenge. This is the stuff we need to get past and get over because it does us, it does us no good. Um, and I think one of the things that's happening, first of all, people are not thinking intersectionally. They're thinking in little flat stereotypes. But also, I think sometimes some of this stuff comes from the fact that we have all been hurt. And there's an expression, hurt people hurt people. Have you heard it? Yes. Think about it. You know, there's an expression in sociology called horizontal hostility. And horizontal hostility is what happens when we feel powerless, when we're being hurt. Sometimes it feels too overwhelming to like, figure out like, how do you actually challenge your oppression from the oppressor, like how do you do that? You don't, it's like sometimes that just feels so overwhelming. And so instead of doing that, we take out our frustration and our hurt and our fear sideways on each other. We take it out horizontally. And we act really rotten to each other. Have you ever had that happen to you? So this is, this is something I really want to challenge. My friend Warren Blumenfeld uses the example of the abused child who goes and then picks on his little brother. And then the little brother goes and kicks the family dog. This is horizontal hostility, and as far as I'm concerned, this serves no constructive purpose. And I want to ask you all just to think about that, and think about what that means, and think about how that plays out in our community, and how we can avoid it, because does it make us stronger as a community? So let's focus on challenging you know, the real oppression, the real problem, and not, not pushing against each other. So Audre Lorde, another brilliant black feminist, wrote, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And you know what, when I hear this, what I think it means is that in order to move forward, in order to actually make progress, we need new tools. We need new ways of doing things. We need new ways of interacting and relating to each other. We can't just take the crap that we grew up learning and do it to each other. We really need to think about new ways, new ways of being. And so this is our challenge, you know, to um, work together across all of our differences and in spite of sometimes discomfort, to expand our circles. And we also need to think of new ways to share what we've learned. Raise your hand if you're learning a lot. I mean, in, in the world, in general, at this point in your life. You know, I think one of the things we need to do is figure out ways to take what we've learned. Because raise your hand if you have a circle of friends where you feel like you can be your full self. Don't you want that circle to be bigger? I think this is one of our challenges. We are, we are in this amazing moment where we are creating, I'll actually say more, you are creating, and I am learning from you. You are creating these new ways of being, these new ways of understanding identity that have never been done before. You're creating a whole new frame. It's really, really exciting the ways in which y'all are shifting the frame. And one of our challenges is to figure out how do we take all the stuff we're learning? How do we take these new ways of understanding gender, new ways of understanding sexuality, new ways of understanding identity, new ways of understanding community? How do we take those things and expand our circles, increase the number of people who think in these same complicated ways. And this is a lot of work. This is really, really hard work. This is really, really hard work. And sometimes it's work that gets done one human being at a time. Sometimes it's done one conversation at a time. And, but we have to do this because the more people who have a clue, the safer we're all going to be. 
So think about ways that you can help transmit some of the information you know onto other people. And I think that's a really challenging and sensitive and difficult thing to do because in some ways, do you feel like sometimes like you're a mile away from everybody else? Like you go to the outside world and you're like, what's going on here? Like, yeah, they're still stuck in all these binaries and all this stuff. So I feel like one of the challenges is to figure out ways to take people from zero to some higher number. Because I think sometimes if you just start saying the things that you know in the language that you use every day with your friends, people are going to shut down. They're going to go blank because they're not going to have a clue what you're talking about. So I think sometimes the challenge is figuring out how do we work in translation. You know, because we have our safe spaces, our own bubbles where we feel like we can be ourselves, but then we also have to work in translation. We also have to figure out, like, how do you talk to your grandma? How do you talk to, you know, some other kid at school who's not familiar with the ways that you think about things? So I really want to invite us to think creatively and to put a lot of our creative energy into figuring out how to do that. Because we need to do that, because the bigger our circle is, the safer we're going to be the more people who understand the things that we are starting to understand, the safer we're going to be. And also, remember that in any group of people, there are people, raise your hand if you've ever come into a new group of people and they were talking about stuff and you had no idea what they were talking about. So we also need to be kind and understanding to each other and remember that we didn't all grow up knowing some of the stuff that we know now and that when people come in, sometimes they don't know. Raise your hand if you ever put your foot in your mouth and said something that you just think, I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I was that offensive. So just think about that and try to be kind to each other. And instead of saying, you're a total jerk for saying that, instead of saying that, try to think, like, how can you explain what it is that they don't know? Because our systems, our educational systems, for the most part, are not teaching us what we need to know. And so we need to teach each other. And to quote another one of my black feminist sheroes, Bernice Johnson Regan, she said, she wrote, if you're in a coalition and you're comfortable, you know it's not a broad enough coalition. So let's appreciate each other's complexities. Let's appreciate each other's contributions. Let's remember that every single one of us has something valuable to bring to the conversation. And let's hold each other up. I need to put on my glasses. <laughs> okay. Let's hold each other up even when we're tired and frustrated. Let's applaud each other's efforts. Let's teach each other. And let's not forget to say thank you to each other. Thank you for holding out hope and inspiration and passion in this messed up world. Thank you for speaking truth to power. Thank you for taking a stand. And thank you for all you do. And as Kate Bornstein likes to say, let's be kind to each other. Let's assume that other people have good intentions. And instead of shutting people down when they do something wrong or make a mistake, let's really try to work with them and see if they're open to hearing and learning what it is that we are realizing that they don't know yet. And I want to just end by talking a little bit about change. Raise your hand if you have a commitment to change the world. I want to just talk a little bit about change because when I think, here's a quick story is that I got this little rubber stamp once that said conform, go crazy, or become an artist. And I really liked that stamp. And then I was thinking, but I'm not an artist. But then I realized, then I realized, I got this idea that activists are actually artists. Activists are cultural artists. Because what, what activists do is that we imagine a world that doesn't yet exist. We imagine a way of being in the world that doesn't yet exist, and we take action to bring that vision into reality. And that is, in fact, a form of art. So anyone here who is an activist is also an artist. Our palette is the world. And so I just want to invite you in closing to go out there and you know, use what you know. Use what you know and think about every possible 
artistic and creative tool at your disposal, at your disposal to, trans, like, to take what you know and transmit it out and to help other people to know it too. Because that's when we're going to be safer. That's when we're going to be safer, and that's when other people are going to be safer as well. So thank you all for being here today, and thank you for everything. I'm sure you've already done a lot of wonderful things in this world. I'm sure you've already had a lot of amazing conversations. I'm sure you've already made a lot of change. So just get out there and make some more. And thank you for everything you've done. I see you. I appreciate you. And I value you. Thank you.